Right, welcome to this uh, third gathering, gathering of um, sort of thoughts and ideas about medieval manuscripts in a sort of a public setting. It's going to be very much like the previous um, sessions in that I'm going to talk very casually, uh, although it is very scripted, and I can show you this in my notes after if you're interested. Um, today it's going to be at about so something totally different than we've talked about so far, and um, not that you need any of the previous information to understand this talk, but it's going to be about uh, a type of book that is very close to my own heart, that is not so much the medical book as such, but the scruffy manuscript. Um, and as a as book historian, manuscripts that are very shiny, filled with gold and images, um, the ones that you see in uh, museum and uh, exhibitions, those are far less interesting for me because I can predict what they will look like. You know, apart from the shininess, I know what the choir construction looks like. I know how large they are, and they will all be very nice and neatly be made. Because of course, this is done for money, for profit. Um, something we'll talk about uh, tomorrow in the public lecture, um, and therefore will have been done according to the norm. Medical books is a very different story because this is not commonly done, at least not in the age that I'm talking about today, which will be the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Um, is not done in that in those periods, um, at least not very much, in a, in a uh, commercial setting, which means that it's either the people who would use the books, who made them, and that's always good as a medieval historian of the book because that means that somebody is following his own nose and, and uh, sort of his own muscles rather than uh, abiding by the rules of what books ought to look like in a certain city. Um, or, so, by a person himself or by um, an expert who's working in the field, in this case in medicine, making a copy of a book for somebody else. So you can see this, for example, in little notations at the back of books. We call them colophons. And in it, it sometimes says, um, this book was made by me, William, and I made it in Paris, and I'm going to use it because I'm a physician. I have one of those, actually. It sounds very uh, <laughs> la di -la -di, but it is actually one colophon. Another one, uh, an example, also a real, real life colophon from Utrecht from the 1460s, says, I am a physician. And I copy this book for another physician, and I use all the books I have in my own library. Both settings produce medical manuscripts, uh, what we'll talk about today, and both are sort of prone to be not so neat, um, very utilitarian, although I hate that word because every book, of course, you make to be used because it's too expensive not to use it, just put it on the shelf, as we sometimes do. But utilitarian in the sense that it was used for a practical purpose, namely to study medicine, and, but not always, to meet, make people better. So medieval medicine is a great area to study because it doesn't always um, help you as a sick person. But um, the books there are very interesting because they also have sort of a theoretical basis. And we'll, we'll meet one of those books uh, in Accentio later because uh, there's a very nice old handbook for physicians that actually uh, provides mostly a theoretical background of the healing process and not actual practical tips as in, you know, hold arm, cut, uh, cut in there, incision, etc. So there's two types of different, two different types of books in medicine. That is the practical books and there's the theoretical books. Um, this is just by uh, means of introduction um, to fill the time until the last person is uh, coming. <laughs> <laughs> now let's start. Um, Medicine is uh, a discipline as it is in the Middle Ages, as it is now for us, and it is very uh, sort of intensely studied at the university from the 13th century onwards, at other institutions of higher education in the 12th century, and it will sort of go into the 16th century when medical books are being printed, it's still being used in a class setting, etc., and goes on to our modern um, era. In the 12th century, however, it was there's, there's medical books around, but not so very many. If you go to the very early 12th century, there's actually very few medical books in the tradition as we have it now. Say, a book that is um, aimed at making you better, that is aimed at uh, using information that you have acquired during healing somebody else, for example, not very successfully, <laughs> and now you can do it differently. So there's a, there's a certain trial and error in the books that appear from the early 12th century in Europe. Before, before that age, in the 9th century even, we also have medical texts, but those are of a very different type. Those are more uh, theoretical, as in almost religious, theological. Um, it might, uh, for example, explain that you are sick because you have done th something wrong. 
And so to, in order to heal yourself, you need to change your behavior and not so much. There's sort of no, no physical change is sort of bestowed on the body. There's nothing cut off or, or changed in color or, or in smell, but it's merely your behavior that changes. That's not the kind of medical book that you see from the early 12th century, and it's not the kind of book that I want to talk about uh, today. So today I'm going to talk about manuscripts that contain texts that were translated primarily from Arabic, but also uh, sort of uh, by proxy from Greek, and that will come clear later. So lots of the Arabic uh, medical tradition is actually uh, a lot of Greek stuff that came into that tradition, and that sort of came into the West from the late 11th century onwards. So I'm talking about medicine, Arabic-based medicine in the West from the middle of the 11th century, that is then of the uh, practical nature that is actually trying to work with smells, colors, uh, shapes, um, and improving uh, a person who has certain complaints. Um, this kind of medicine is part of a larger scientific scene. Uh, zoology is introduced, for example, mathematics, astronomy, astrology, um, uh, herbology, all those things are new to the West. Same thing as before, some texts uh, were in existence in the 9th and 10th centuries, but in the late 11th century we see that from Arabic this influx of more specific, very rich knowledge-based um, texts in these other scientific fields are um, sort of flowing into Europe, and we'll get into that, how they practically work as well. So two things, Arabic-based will be important today, and medicine is part of a larger scientific package, if you want. If you look at uh, medicine in that particular, that particular way, this, so with the, the background of Arabic and um, uh, the larger scene of scientific works, then three stages may be distinguished. And I'm going to tell you right from the start that I'm only going to talk about the first. Could I maybe ask you to go up here? Oh. Thank you. Okay, three stages. Stage one, um, books, well this is you know, pretty straightforward, but yeah. Books from the age um, of early Eastern medicine in the West are being introduced. So I'm talking late, late 11th, early 12th century. I have a picture of that. Oops, I don't have a picture of that. <laughs> um, the second, oh, it, it, that's this one. I chose it too, that's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, don't, I don't have to do anything, it's right here. So, so that's the basis then for these early stage books that I just described, the translators being very busy from Arabic into Latin. Second stage is when books um, from the context of education um, are more and more uh, cases sort of containing scientific texts, including medicine. So there we are in the, say, late 12th century throughout the 13th century, where the university, of course, becomes the primary basis for higher education. And uh, medicine becomes part of a larger scientific scene, as I just explained there. So that's the second stage, where it becomes embedded in a formal uh, institution of education. And the third stage is, um, I've dubbed it the vernacular books of medicine, which is when it makes this other jump into another culture, which is from Latin into the vernacular, whether it's English, Dutch, French, German, etc. It reaches a different audience, the texts start to look different once again, and the texts start to be adapted uh, to this, um, adopted, no, oh, sorry, adapted, yes, right verb, um, to this particular uh, new scenery where middle class readers, for example, are getting an interest in these texts, and also where um, physicians and surgeons who do not necessarily operate, uh, no pun intended, in Latin, but are um, uh, more fluent in the vernacular, and so these traditional Arabic texts that be translated into Latin then also start to be translated in English and Dutch and French and German vernacular. So three stages. I'm primarily going to talk about the first because that's, uh, you know, I got quite a bit to, to talk about. Um, the second stage I'll refer to at the end just to make that connection to my previous um, public talk which was about um, um, uh, textbooks in the classroom. And the vernacular books of medicine you can ask me questions about. I know, I know very much about this. I, I, I've taught classes uh, on it, but um, I, I thought if I start that here too, we will not be out of here before 8 o'clock tonight. So I'll, I decided to skip that. Okay, um, this is sort of typical for how I uh, build up these things. So you know now what, what we're sort of going to do and what it's all about. And I'm going to draw a very large circle around the topic. 
So I'm going to give you the cultural historical background of these scientific texts becoming available in Europe. And then I'm going to zoom in on some scientific texts, and then I'm going to zoom in on medicine, and then I'm going to zoom in on one particular manuscript. So it's a nice sort of circle, and at the nucleus of it stands a very intriguing book that, I've, um, that I'm writing at the moment, uh, a book about myself with somebody else. Okay, so this story has to start with the 12th century Renaissance, which is a period that is at the heart of the project that was already mentioned that I'm um, directing in Leiden with now five individuals. Um, it's a very, very intriguing period in that, just like the 14th century, a lot of things are happening. I find the 11th century, uh, there's not, not so many things are happening. If you zoom in, of course, on individual cities, persons, institutions, lots of things are happening, but if you look at cultural of, uh, aspects of Europe or intellectual scene, it's not all that much that changes. The 13th century, things are you know, in motion, but more or less along the same lines, but the 12th century and the 14th century, but particularly the 12th century, is a century of change, and this change is important for understanding medicine and the larger context of the sciences. So what's the 12th century Renaissance? Well, so many things are happening, I would almost say, uh, what's it not? It's all-encompassing. Um, it's the introduction of a new type of learning, scientific, but also in theology, um, in dialect dialectics, the revival of the classics. So it's the age where scholars start to be interested in more things than they were before, and in different things. It's also an age where scholars start to be very verbal and explicit about their interest in these things. Um, they start to discuss uh, knowledge, whereas before they would have just received it uh, by themselves, reading a book, for example, in, in a library or in, a, in their monastic cells. In the uh, 12th century Renaissance, people would actually try to interact with each other, see if they can advance their knowledge, and see if the other person understood it as well as they did. And you get these wonderful uh, discussions, and people start to be very punny and uh, attack each other. So that's sort of a, it's an environment where there's more bubbles, more things are going on. Um, and in this is a new body of text that includes medicine, but also a number of other things. It's done by members of the church, the clergy. Um, so scholars in this period are generally uh, members of the church. So they, um, this tells you something about um, um, you know, their interest. For example, theology is very important. Some things they will not touch because it's too um, um, heretic. And other, other things they'd like to touch because it's so heretic. So, so there's, there's advances made, made as well in this respect. It's interesting to see that starting in the late 11th century, clergymen start to broaden their scope of the things that they read, uh, the manner in which they discuss it, sort of in a more lively sense, because, of course, it's also the period where the clergy is having a very different attitude towards the East. So <coughs> where, as I will show you in a minute, in Spain, for example, they, they, they start to make friends with people from the East, from, with Arabs, uh, exchanging text ideas, uh, you know, sitting uh, in the proverbial bar together, um, uh, drinking a beer. Well, the clergyman will not have done that, but you know, no problem. We're just interacting with each other. On the other side of Europe, or rather, just outside of Europe, they were doing this with each other. So, it's remarkable. I find it's the same individuals, right? It's the clergy that sent these uh, people to uh, the East, in, in including themselves. But on the other side of Europe, there was a very different attitude towards um, this group of aliens, as they sometimes uh, call them. The um, alien knowledge, so knowledge um, acquired through the East and by proxy from the Greek culture, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, um, is having an enormous influence on the intellectual culture of Europe, not just because it provided new texts to individuals, but also it started to spark changes. And just to give you one example, this could not have been built without the knowledge that, f that was flowing into the Latin West from Eastern uh, um, culture. So for, for example, this is the, the, the cathedrals, how they were different from previous churches is that they were very high. Uh, it's all about uh, height and light, as I always uh, tell my students. So it's about designing something that can uh, be sustained while it's going very, up, very high up from, from sort of gravity has um, uh, pulls it into place, so to speak, because, for example, the, the vaults, the, the ceilings were built so that, you know, all the stains were put together and held the whole thing in place. That knowledge, the math that was at the basis of this, the symmetry that you see in cathedrals, for example, if you slice a cathedral in half, you have two halves that are actually um, um, symmetrical. 
that's something just that one just that that aspect of it um, is something that flows in from the east and so this is a good example practical example of the application of knowledge that was acquired elsewhere and put into place put into practice um, in the west this is the same with the sciences and with medicine in particular so before we go into medicine I'm just gonna paste a very broad picture of how this stuff arrived and uh, I'm not gonna use um, uh, medicine as such because we'll get to talk about that in a minute I'm gonna look at a text by Aristotle because he forms a very good example of knowledge from the East that arrives in the West and it includes a number of medical texts and on plants and on the, and, and a great deal of scientific texts as well so let's have a look how that uh, arrived here and then we know um, how long this road was and how um, unique it actually is that all this uh, information arrived um, in the West Okay, first step, for Aristotle at least, is that these texts are written. And this happens in Aristotle's case um, in the 4th uh, century BC. So, for example, among his works are the poetics, uh, ethics, politics, rhetoric, but also astronomy on plants, on the heavens, etc. So a very broad variety of texts. And if you were here in the previous um, public lecture, you'll remember that the corpus vetustius, the old corpus, in the universities of the 13th century contained up to 24 of his works. So this was a very, very important author for um, training people in scientific knowledge, although it was done at the arts uh, faculty, oddly enough. So step, step one is the production of these texts in the period itself, in the Greek, in Greek, Greek period. Second step is the transmission from Greek to Arabic culture. Um, and this happens, for example, through Syrian Christian scholars, um, who traveled uh, and brought texts with them to other parts. We have uh, astronom astronomical texts and mathematical texts coming in through India. So through various roads, these works started to be sort of included in Arabic <coughs> intellectual culture. We have, of course, um, in Baghdad, Baghdad, the 10th century translation school, where a great deal of these texts were uh, translated and also commented upon. And these comments, commentaries uh, proved to be very important later in the last stage, which we'll talk about in a second, when it goes from Arabic into Latin, because by that time, and you can imagine now, we, we've gone through uh, Greek and then Syrian, Arabic, and then into Latin. By the time it arrived in Latin, it wasn't always clear what Aristotle meant with these texts. So people read it and thought, what does this mean? And so they, they would discuss with each other and of course didn't always get very, very far with this. And so these commentaries of <coughs> Arabs who had, had the same problem, but made sense, of it, made sense of it, when those started to be translated into Latin, it all made more sense. And so what we see in the Latin West is an influx of both um, scientific texts, from Greek a little bit into Latin, yes, and uh, also commentaries. And those prove vital for the institutions <coughs> of learning, for example. <coughs> Step three is the transmission from Arabic to Latin, uh, which of course is for medicine a vital um, stage because this is where the texts that will function in the West in Latin were in partly also crafted. So what the Arabs did was use Greek knowledge and craft their own works, as was very common in the Middle Ages. You are not, uh, will not be accused of being uh, uh, of, of plagiarism if you just take a number of words or, or the text, a large chunk of somebody's text literally, and add a few things, and it's still your work. So it's a very different attitude nowadays, and students should not pay attention to this, of course, because it's very different now. <laughs> but the result is that the Arabs took certain uh, knowledge and information, a body of knowledge from Greek culture, and added their own um, analysis, synthesis to it, and that, will, that was what entered into the West. So it's this last, sta last stage is uh, important for um, medical texts and medical culture in the West. An important location for this stage, so from Arabic into Latin, is uh, Spain. And here is the mosque at uh, Cordoba, but another interesting uh, place is Toledo. We'll get to talk about that in a second. But Cordoba, just to give you a hint of the vibrant intellectual culture that was present, uh, Cordoba had um, a, a 70 libraries, and the largest we know contained 600,000 books. And compare that to the West, where the largest 
library at the time was in Paris, at the, the growing university, and it had 400 books. <laughs> and it's not that Paris said, oh gosh, I wish we had more books. They were very proud of the number of books that they had. So that was the body of knowledge available in the West versus the text and commentaries available in the East. It's a very different balance, very different um, um, sort of uh, yeah, intellectual culture, much richer. And that's, of course, what um, was uh, entering the West in, in Latin. I must say that by the 14th century, the University of Paris, they would like me to say this, um, had grown to 2,000 volumes. You know, the, we have lots of books there too, they would say that. But still, it's not, it's not 600,000. Um, what happened in Spain, and this is also important for our understanding of medicine, and we'll, we'll get there very soon, um, is that translation schools start to appear. So it's not just individuals in their own uh, back rooms uh, translating these works. No, it's groups of individuals working together, um, turning out sort of systematically almost a number of texts. And the reason behind this is that it was often organized by the church. Oddly enough, in Spain, there was a very different attitude, as we already saw, uh, seen uh, towards the east from people of the Western clergy. But um, we can also imagine that this happened, this group work, as it were, coordinated, because it was very difficult to do by yourself. The body of, uh, of knowledge is just too vast and also the language is too complicated. And this is something that people are looking at, uh, at uh, right now. Are we really to assume, I'm just raising the question, I'm not gonna talk about it because it leads me away from this track. Um, are we to assume that these people came to Spain from sp cities like Paris or even Scotland, we have an example of that, um, and acquired that language, Arabic, to the extent that they could translate these very complex works? The answer was always yes, but now recently, um, but also some voices are actually from the 1930s. People are saying, well, there must be an in-between stage somewhere. For, for example, Spanish vernacular or uh, Jews in Spain who uh, knew both Arabic and Latin and, and also Spanish. Um, so Mose Arabs, um, Christians who were, um, who were also available, uh, able to, to use both languages and sort of receive one and give it on to people in the other. So when I say translation schools, we should actually not think of uh, not just one person translating or not even a group of people but talking about an institution where um, Western clergymen are translating with the help of all sorts of other individuals that walk around and we have lots of references to this because for example when um, a translator becomes very famous like Michael Scott in the 13th century people start to say well he didn't translate all these things himself he had help for example, Andreas, a Jew, helped him, or th this and that person helped him. So we have voices from the 13th century reflecting on these schools as being an institution where you know lots of things are happening. It's not just one individual or a group. It's actually the school itself, the institution that produces all these works. Um, in Spain, of course, uh, King Alfonso VI is, is important to sort of create the environment for doing this for the first time in the late 11th century, but also Alfonso X, um, in the mid um, the 13th century, the same individual who creates the uh, University of Seville um, is also um, encouraging this. And that's where he is. Um, this slide is actually showing you the most important city for our story, because here we see in Toledo a lot of bishops and clergymen from the West encouraging uh, the translation of these works from Arabic into Latin. Um, it happens, uh, surprisingly enough, I find, considering that first slide I showed you with uh, the battle between East and West, it happens in the uh, cathedral. So in the cathedral, there is a room and there is these translators. The school is gathering, <laughs> systematically producing at a high rate uh, these translations. Scientific, but also um, uh, theological, mystical texts, even from Hebrew. Um, important for this environment is uh, the Archbishop Raymond, who dies in 1151. So he's he's great. He's a patron of this uh, school, and it's important to have an, a, such a influential people person uh, sort of protecting you. Um, and we see, for example, translators such as uh, Adelaar of Bath, John of Spain, um, who ch who translates the uh, philosopher uh, Avicenna, uh, logic. Then, so he translates logic from Arabic into Latin. And Jared of Cremona, and he's uh, vital for this. Uh, he dies in 1187, so he's working around the middle of the 12th century. 
and he uh, translates over th uh, 70 works of science, including a great deal of medical tracts, including uh, Avicenna's Canon of Medicine. And that will be a, uh, a very important text at the institutions of uh, medicine throughout the ages, all the way up to the 17th century. Uh, he also translates Asterio, uh, Aristotle, um, various texts, and this is where it happens. And he translates the uh, Almagest, the, the great work which travels from, uh, this is a very good uh, um, uh, text to show you how it works then, because it captures the things that I've talked about so far. It travels from Greek into Arabic into Latin. And you can see by the manuscripts uh, that the Latin tradition is it's prettier as books, but it's not what you want, because it's not so utilitarian, doesn't have so many schemes, doesn't have uh, so much detail often, uh, uh, like tables, etc., as you have in other places. It's a great topic for another paper, but I should not talk about it um, today. Okay, so that's sort of the background. Starting in the late 11th century, the West encountered this wealth of information um, of Greek texts, went through Arabic into Latin, or original Arabic texts that were translated into Latin in places such as Spain, but also Italy, Sicily, uh, and as we will see in a moment, in um, uh, Monte Cassino, uh, very close to Rome. Now, what's so special about this knowledge, apart from the fact that it was new? There's a number of things why this knowledge stands out when you uh, look at sort of the making of so the sciences in the West. And there's two things that are very important. Uh, one is that the Arabs were very advanced in these fields. And just to give you an example uh, from ge uh, geometry, sorry, geometry and astronomy, um, they had a great deal of new texts, uh, new, is what the people in the, in the Latin West would say, that of information that they did not have at all before. I mean, uh, the University Library of Paris had few books. That's because th there was not more available. You know, had that been more, then this library would have been bigger. So um, astronomy is one of those fields where the Arabs are very sort of advanced. And you can see it, oh, see the uh, astrolabe there in that uh, manuscript image. And we have the actual astrolabes as well from the 11th and 12th centuries. Just, do you want just one uh, sort of uh, example. It's to measure the, uh, the constellations. And that's something that the West was given. So a practical thing that now people could experience and do and practice um, themselves. Another thing, an example of something that uh, arrived, and that actually was much earlier, but uh, this is from around the year 1000, uh, Pope Sylvester II. Um, he was uh, already looking at the East for getting specific scientific information, so well before our period, but he was sort of pushed down. He was not allowed to do it anymore. He was called at the time, uh, you know, he's, he has a pact with the devil because he gets all this weird information from, from, from Arabs. Um, and one of the things that he, for example, already came with was the zero, the void, literally um, translated. Um, but that's something that will actually be uh, introduced much later um, as part of a larger package of mathematics. And this is not e late 11th century even or 12th century. It, we have to wait till the early uh, 13th century to have this in the mathematical textbooks. So it takes a while before the zero catches on. But uh, Pope Sylvester was already very early um, with it. Uh, this is uh, Fibonacci, and he's the one that starts to uh, implement this, and then we're in the middle of the 13th century. And he starts to train individuals and provide school books that help you do this, um, how to calculate with Arabic numbers. And this, of course, was a revelation because it's, tr you know, try to add up Roman numerals, make a complex uh, uh, um, uh, calculation with it. It's impossible. But with uh, Arabic numerals, it's very easy. I know this because we all do it every day. And the zero, of course, came in very handy and was also uh, very quickly started to be used for other things. And here's another very handy application in our own field, and we're nearing towards books. Um, that is as page numbers, in this case, a folium number, foliated on one side of the page. Um, so this is uh, 240. Um, if you want to do this in Arabic numerals, you need a great deal of sorry, in uh, Roman numerals, you need a great deal of the upper margin to do the same thing. So this is, a, you know, it's, it's a great thing to do if you can read it. Otherwise, of course, it's a pain to have uh, 
Arabic numerals in your, in your book that you, for example, acquire secondhand. For, you know, can you imagine the surprise if somebody buys this book, two years of saving, opens it up, and there's things in there they can't read. <laughs> but it's a handy thing also efficiently. Uh, it's uh, efficient-wise. It's, it's something that helps you um, find your text, but it actually takes a very little bit of space on the page. This is the scenery in which we have to place medicine, the coming of medicine. The broader scenery of scientific knowledge, of little bits of pieces of information that were not so scientific as such, the zero, but still, I don't know what it is, it's almost philosophical to have nothing meaning something. But that was set and introduced in uh, the West and medicine was part of this larger scene. Um, this is one of the things that, um, so, so medicine is very broad, of course, but this is one of the things that was new that entered the West very early on in the late 12th century, which is uh, hu human uh, anatomy. And I like to think that, you know, the images are more or less the same, but you can see there's much more text on the page in the Latin version. So it's much more explaining is done, and um, it's, it's also more simplistic. So this is, you know, it's more realistic. Uh, not that I know how these things look, but I can imagine that that's more like what it looks like than this. So this is almost like schematic. This is the idea behind it, still a little bit theor theoretical, whereas that one is more practical. A person has actually been sliced open, and let's see what the color and the shape is of all these intestines that we have in there. That's, that's not done for this, of course, because it's just being uh, copied from the Eastern tradition, but also it shows you not always with the full knowledge of what's actually going on. So in part, it's also just copying a body of knowledge, and then you have to find out actually what it means. The other thing that's very important early on is the manner of uh, transmission, that's to say in a setting of education. And that's also was not done in the West until this particular period. And we have to wait until the late 12th century or the middle of the 12th century for this to happen. But um, the, the classroom is an important uh, conduit for this knowledge because it gives you a setting where you can actually spar with individuals trying to find out what's really going on and also, of course, where a teacher tells you this is what's going on. So it's always a nice uh, mix of the two. Um, that's what we have on the left. So it's a tradition that comes from Arabic um, uh, culture. And we, we then, there's a very late image in Dutch. Uh, we have a similar setting at the end of the Middle Ages um, as a normal uh, means to provide people with scientific knowledge. OK, let's have a look at the early period uh, as far as medicine is concerned. So I'm, I'm not talking about the 13th century or the 14th century. I want to look at this dawn of the arrival of medicine in the West as part of this um, larger package of uh, the sciences. The value of medical knowledge to the West is twofold. Eastern medicine is trial and error based and based on physical evidence. It's what I said um, at the very start of my talk. That's one, so I don't have to say anything about it anymore. The other thing is this, um, this tradition that promotes knowledge <coughs> as a classroom um <coughs> subject. So something that you can uh, talk about in a setting of enriching yourself. So not so much as uh, improving yourself because you're a physician, but you're not a physician yet, but you're training to be one. And that's where you're being taught all these things. It's very normal for us because, of course, we don't have uh, students, first year students of medicine uh, actually operating on people and thank goodness we don't. But, but for the West that was new where you have a situation where you learn something in a, in, in a classroom setting like this and medicine was part of that larger picture. <coughs> um, just to give you one example and I'm moving um, inwards one more circle towards my actual nucleus that one manuscript. This is a, a very important, crucial text for the West. It's, it's a handbook that provides all the information that you need to be a physician. It presents it in two parts, the theoretical part and the practical part. So the theory uh, is uh, of the, the humors and uh, when you're too hot or you're too yellow, it's sort of a very medieval um, way of looking at um, conditions and of the functioning of human beings. But uh, the second part, the practical part, was very important, of course, because that provides practical information, how to operate and how to uh, inquire if somebody's sick and what those sicknesses, illnesses might have been or might be. <coughs> this is um, the 
text by Almagusi. It's a 10th century text, and this is a copy from the very early 13th century. That is to say, the one on the right, the one on the left, it has a new title page that is much younger. So if you're an Arabist um, and you're about to protest and say, that's not 13th century, then I can say, yes, you're right. It's not 13th century. But the right-hand side is. So this particular work was translated into Latin, not in Spain, not in Sicily, but in Monte Cassino. And it was done by Constantine the African, who you see here teaching uh, medicine. And I just uh, tweeted uh, an image uh, announcing this paper on Twitter. And um, uh, I, I tweeted a similar image where people are actually holding these bottles. This is not a drink. This is urine that you look at because you need to see what the color is. And uh, th this is actually a very popular uh, picture in medical handbooks. In fact, the one I will show you, a very early one, uh, in a moment. So Constant the African is an interesting figure in this whole medical business, uh, and also a vital one, because what he does, he comes from um, Tunisia, and he arrives uh, in the West, in Italy, um, in the 1060s or 1070s, and he uh, first goes to um, um, various uh, places, and he ends up finally in Monte Cassino. And Monte Cassino is one of the largest and oldest monasteries in the West. It's where uh, St. Benedict uh, taught and lived. And it's, a, it's a, the cultural, intellectual center of uh, Italy, but I would argue also f f for the West in, in, in general. So this is where uh, Constantine arrives, and he has a number of things with him. He has books with him, uh, although there's a, a, a story that says that he capsized and a number of books were also lost. But we can imagine that he has a number of Arabic uh, texts with him. <laughs> oh, nice, nice crowd. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. It is 3.30. My name is Andrew Gao. I'm a professor of history. Uh, and uh, it was uh, my fault that Eric came to the university, <laughs> poor man, for the beginning of winter. <laughs> We're delighted to have him here. Some of you have heard him speak already. Eric is associate professor at the University of Leiden, where he is principal investigator of a very substantial research grant uh, from the Dutch Organization for Scientific Research, research their SHIRK. Turning Over a New Leaf, Manuscript Innovation in, in the 12th Century Renaissance, which is a large five-year project <coughs> that he has been uh, working on for a couple of years now. He taught at the University of British Columbia and at the University of Victoria, whence he came to Edmonton a number of times uh, to give workshops and master classes to various groups, including most especially uh, graduate students uh, under the aegis of the Medieval and Early Modern Institute. Uh, we have been fortunate to get funding from the Distinguished Visiting Professor uh, piece of the Killam Fund to invite Eric for two weeks of talks, workshops, master classes, and expert consultation on uh, some of one of the library's most uh, precious and oldest manuscripts. Uh, Eric has published uh, extensively uh, so many books and articles that I am not going to labor the room with them, partly because most of you will have heard these titles already. <coughs> I have been asked by one of the people who put a great deal of effort into organizing Eric's, Eric's visit, Melanie and Marvin over here uh, from the Department of History and Classics, to ask you how you heard about this talk uh, and to try to get a sense of where our advertising worked and where it didn't. And other, other people from the journal? All right, so almost half the room. There we are. And otherwise, internally, I take it. Any other? The university town crier email? Aha, uh -huh, the, the uh, <laughs> probably faculty of arts town crier, or? I think it's the one or that. Or the faculty of medicine. Oh, poster in faculty of medicine. Mm -hmm. Gloria Lauber and Dean 
website. Ah, good. Thank you. University homepage. Oh, the homepage. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Thank you. And thus, uh, I've thanked Melanie again. Uh, Rob Desjardins, who's the other person who organized, was, uh, cannot be here today. And that's enough for me. Thank you, Eric. All right, welcome to this uh, third gathering, gathering of um, sort of thoughts and ideas about medieval manuscripts in a sort of a public setting. It's going to be very much like the previous um, sessions in that I'm going to talk very casually, uh, although it is very scripted, and I can show you this in my notes after if you're interested. Um, today it's going to be at about something totally different than we've talked about so far, and um, not that you need any of the previous information to understand this talk, but it's going to be about uh, a type of book that is very close to my own heart, that is not so much the medical book as such, but the scruffy manuscript. Um, and as a as book historian, manuscripts that are very shiny, filled with gold and images, um, the ones that you see in uh, museum and uh, exhibitions, those are far less interesting for me because I can predict what they will look like. You know, apart from the shininess, I know what the choir construction looks like. I know how large they are, and they will all be very nice and neatly be made. Because, of course, this is done for money, for profit. Um, something we'll talk about uh, tomorrow in the public lecture, um, and therefore will have been done according to the norm. Medical books is a very different story because this is not commonly done, at least not in the age that I'm talking about today, which will be the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Um, is not done in that. In those periods, um, at least not very much, in a, in a uh, commercial setting, which means that it's either the people who would use the books who made them, and that's always good as a medieval historian of the book because that means that somebody is following his own nose and, and uh, sort of his own muscles rather than uh, abiding by the rules of what books ought to look like in a certain city. Um, or, so, by a person himself or by um, an expert who's working in the field, in this case in medicine, making a copy of a book for somebody else. So you can see this, for example, in little notations at the back of books. We call them colophons. And in it, it sometimes says, um, this book was made by me, William, and I made it in Paris, and I'm going to use it because I'm a physician. I have one of those, actually. It sounds very uh, <laughs> la di -la -di, but it is actually one colophon. Another one, uh, an example, also a real, real life colophon from Utrecht from the 1460s, says, I am a physician. And I copy this book for another physician, and I use all the books I have in my own library. Both settings produce medical manuscripts, uh, what we'll talk about today, and both are sort of prone to be not so neat, um, very utilitarian, although the, I hate that word because every book, of course, you make to be used because that's too expensive not to use it, just put it on the shelf, as we sometimes do. But utilitarian in the sense that it was used for a practical purpose, namely to study medicine, and, but not always, to meet, make people better. So medieval medicine is a great area to study because it doesn't always um, help you as a sick person. But um, the books uh, are very interesting because they also have sort of a theoretical basis. And we'll, we'll meet one of those books uh, in Extensio later because uh, there's a very nice old handbook for physicians that actually uh, provides mostly a theoretical background of the healing process and not actual practical tips as in, you know, hold arm, cut, uh, cut in there, incision, etc. So there's two types of different, two different types of books in medicine. That is the practical books and there's the theoretical books. Um, this is just by uh, means of introduction um, to fill the time until the last person is uh, coming. <laughs> <laughs> now let's start. Um, Medicine is uh, a discipline as it is in the Middle Ages, as it is now for us, and it is very uh, sort of intensely studied at the university from the 13th century onwards, at other institutions of higher education in the 12th century, and it will sort of go into the 16th century when medical books are being printed, it's still being used in a class setting, etc., and goes on to our modern um, era. In the 12th century, however, it was there's, there's medical books around, but not so very many. If you go to the very early 12th century, there's actually very few medical books in the tradition as we have it now. Say, a book that is um, aimed at making you better, that is aimed at uh, using information that you have acquired during healing somebody else, 
for example, not very successfully, <laughs> and now you can do it differently. So there's a, there's a certain trial and error in the books that appear from the early 12th century in Europe. Before, before that age, in the 9th century even, we also have medical texts, but those are of a very different type. Those are more uh, theoretical, as in almost religious, theological. Um, it might, uh, for example, explain that you are sick because you have done th something wrong. And so to, in order to heal yourself, you need to change your behavior and not so much. There's sort of no, no physical change is sort of bestowed on the body. There's nothing cut off or, or changed in color or, or in smell, but it's merely your behavior that changes. That's not the kind of medical book that you see from the early 12th century, and it's not the kind of book that I want to talk about uh, today. So today I'm going to talk about manuscripts that contain texts that were translated primarily from Arabic, but also uh, sort of uh, by proxy from Greek and that will come clear later. So lots of the Arabic uh, medical tradition is actually uh, a lot of Greek stuff that came into that tradition and that sort of came into the West from the late 11th century onwards. So I'm talking about medicine, Arabic-based medicine in the West from the middle of the 11th century that is then of the uh, practical nature that is actually trying to work with smells, colors, uh, shapes um, and improving uh, a person who has certain complaints. Um, this kind of medicine is part of a larger scientific scene. Uh, zoology is introduced, for example, mathematics, astronomy, astrology, um, uh, herbology, all those things are new to the West. Same thing as before. Some texts uh, were in existence in the 9th and 10th centuries, but in the late 11th century we see that from Arabic this influx of more specific, very rich knowledge-based um, text in these other scientific fields are um, sort of flowing into Europe and we'll get into that how that practically works as well so two things Arabic based will be important today and medicine is part of a larger scientific package if you want if you look at uh, medicine in that particular the particular way this so with the the background of Arabic and um, uh, the larger scene of scientific works then three stages may be distinguished and I'm going to tell you right from the start that I'm only going to talk about the first. Could I maybe ask you to go up here? Oh. Thank you. Okay, three stages. Stage one, um, books, well this is, you know, pretty straightforward, but yeah. Books from the age um, of early Eastern medicine in the West are being introduced. So talking late, late 11th, early 12th century. I have a picture of that. Oops. I don't have a picture of that. <laughs> um, the second, oh, it, it, that's this one. I chose it too. That's <laughs> a, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't have to do anything. It's right here. So, so that's the basis then for these early stage books that I just described, the translators being very busy from Arabic into Latin. Second stage is when books um, from the context of education um, are more and more uh, cases sort of containing scientific texts, including medicine. So there we are in the, say, late 12th century throughout the 13th century, where the university, of course, becomes the primary basis for higher education. And uh, medicine becomes part of a larger scientific scene, as I just explained there. So that's the second stage, where it becomes embedded in a formal uh, institution of education. And the third stage is um, I've dubbed it the vernacular books of medicine, which is when it makes this other jump into another culture, which is from Latin into the vernacular, whether it's English, Dutch, French, German, etc. It reaches a different audience, the texts start to look different once again, and the texts start to be adapted uh, to this, um, adopted, no, oh, sorry, adapted, yes, right verb, um, to this particular uh, new scenery where middle class readers, for example, are getting an interest in these texts, and also where um, physicians and surgeons who do not necessarily operate, uh, no pun intended, in Latin, but are um, uh, more fluent in the vernacular. And so these traditional Arabic texts that be translated into Latin then also start to be translated in English and Dutch and French and German vernacular. So three stages. I'm primarily going to talk about the first because that's, uh, you know, I got quite a bit to, to talk about. Um, the second stage I'll refer to at the end just to make that connection to my previous um, public talk, which was about... Um, um, uh, textbooks in the classroom and the vernacular books of medicine you can ask me questions about I know I know very much about this I, I, I've 
taught classes uh, on it, but um, I, I thought if I start that here too, we will not be out of here before 8 o'clock tonight. So I'll, I decided to skip that. Okay, um, this is sort of typical for how I uh, build up these things. So you know now what, what we're sort of going to do and what it's all about. And I'm going to draw a very large circle around the topic. So I'm going to give you the cultural historical background of these scientific texts becoming available in Europe. And then I'm going to zoom in on some scientific texts, and then I'm going to zoom in on medicine, and then I'm going to zoom in on one particular manuscript. So it's a nice sort of circle, and at the nucleus of it stands a very intriguing book that, I've, um, that I'm writing at, at the moment, uh, a book about myself with somebody else. Okay, so this story has to start with the 12th century Renaissance, which is a period that is at the heart of the project that was already mentioned that I'm um, directing in Leiden with now five individuals. Um, it's a very, very intriguing period in that, just like the 14th century, a lot of things are happening. I find the 11th century, uh, there's not, not so many things are happening. If you zoom in, of course, on individual cities, persons, institutions, lots of things are happening. But if you look at cultural of, uh, aspects of Europe or intellectual scene, it's not all that much that changes. The 13th century, things are you know, in motion, but more or less along the same lines. But the 12th century and the 14th century, but particularly the 12th century, is a century of change. And this change is important for understanding medicine and the larger context of the sciences. So what's the 12th century Renaissance? Well, so many things are happening. I would almost say, uh, what's it not? It's all encompassing. Um, it's the introduction of a new type of learning scientific, but also in theology, um, in dialect, dialectics, the revival of the classics. So it's the age where scholars start to be interested in more things than they were before and in different things. It's also an age where scholars start to be very verbal and explicit about their interest in these things. Um, they start to discuss uh, knowledge, whereas before they would have just received it by themselves, reading a book, for example, in, in a library or in, a, in their monastic cells. In the uh, 12th century Renaissance, people would actually try to interact with each other, see if they can advance their knowledge, and see if the other person understood it as well as they did. And you get these wonderful uh, discussions, and people start to be very punny and uh, attack each other. So that's sort of a, it's an environment where there's more bubbles, more things are going on. Um, and in this is a new body of text that includes medicine, but also a number of other things. It's done by members of the church, the clergy. Um, so scholars in this period are generally uh, members of the church. So they, um, this tells you something about um, um, you know, their interest. For example, theology is very important. Some things they will not touch because it's too um, um, heretic. And other, other things they'd like to touch because it's so heretic. So, so there's, there's advances made, made as well in this respect. It's interesting to see that starting in the late 11th century, clergymen start to broaden their scope of the things that they read uh, the manner in which they discuss it sort of in a more lively sense because of course it's also the period where the clergy is having a very different attitude towards the East. So <coughs> where, as I will show you in a minute, in Spain for example, they, they, they start to make friends with people from the East, from, with Arabs, uh, exchanging text ideas, uh, you know, sitting uh, in the proverbial bar together, um, uh, drinking a beer. Well, the clergyman will not have done that, but you know, no problem. We're just interacting with each other. On the other side of Europe, or rather, just outside of Europe, they were doing this with each other. So, it's remarkable. I find it's the same individuals, right? It's the clergy that sent these uh, people to uh, the East, in, in including themselves. But on the other side of Europe, there was a very different attitude towards um, this group of aliens, as they sometimes uh, call them. The um, alien knowledge, so knowledge um, acquired through the East and by proxy from the Greek culture, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, um, is having an enormous influence on the intellectual culture of Europe, not just because it provided new texts to individuals, but also it started to spark changes. And just to give you one example, this could not have been built without the knowledge that, f that was flowing into the Latin West from Eastern uh, um, culture. So for, ex for example, this is the, the, the cathedrals, how they were different from previous churches is that they were very high. Uh, it's all about uh, height and light, as I always uh, tell my students. So it's about designing something that can uh, be sustained while it's going very up, very high up from, from sort of gravity has 
um, uh, pulls it into place, so to speak, because, for example, the, the vaults, the, the ceilings were built so that, you know, all the stains were put together and held the whole thing in place. That knowledge, the math that was at the basis of this, the symmetry that you see in cathedrals, for example, if you slice cathedral in half, you have two halves that are actually um, um, symmetrical. <clears throat> That's something, just that one, just that, that aspect of it, um, is something that flows in from the east. And so this is a good example, practical example, of the application of knowledge that was acquired elsewhere and put into place, put into practice um, in the West. This is the same with the sciences and with medicine in particular. So before we go into medicine, I'm just going to paste a very broad picture of how this stuff arrived. And uh, I'm not going to use um, uh, medicine as such because we'll get to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to look at a text by Aristotle because he forms a very good example of knowledge from the East that arrives in the West and it includes a number of medical texts and on plants and, on the, and, and a great deal of scientific text as well. So let's have a look how that uh, arrived here and then we know um, how long this road was and how um, unique it actually is that all this uh, information arrived um, in the West. Okay, first step, <coughs> for Aristotle at least, is that these texts are written. And this happens in Aristotle's case um, in the fourth uh, century BC. So, for example, among his works are the poetics, uh, ethics, politics, rhetoric, but also astronomy on plants, on the heavens, etc. So, a very broad variety of texts. And if you were here in the previous um, public lecture, you'll remember that the Corpus Vetustius, the old corpus, in the universities of the 13th century contained up to 24 of his works. So this was a very, very important author for um, training people in scientific knowledge, although it was done at the arts uh, faculty, oddly enough. So step, step one is the production of these texts in the period itself, in the Greek, uh, Greek, Greek period. Second step is the transmission from Greek to Arabic culture. Um, and this happens, for example, through Syrian Christian scholars, um, who traveled uh, and brought texts with them to other parts. We have uh, astronom astronomical texts and mathematical texts coming in through India. So through various roads, these works started to be sort of included in Arabic <coughs> intellectual culture. We have, of course, um, in Baghdad, Baghdad, the 10th century translation school, where a great deal of these texts were uh, translated and also commented upon. And these comments, commentaries uh, proved to be very important later in the last stage, which we'll talk about in a second, when it goes from Arabic into Latin, because by that time, and you can imagine now, we, we've gone through uh, Greek and then Syrian, Arabic, and then into Latin. By the time it arrived in Latin, it wasn't always clear what Aristotle meant with these texts. So people read it and thought, what does this mean? And so they, they would discuss with each other and of course didn't always get very, very far with this. And so these commentaries of <coughs> Arabs who had, had the same problem but made sense, of it, made sense of it, when those started to be translated into Latin, it all made more sense. And so what we see in the Latin West is an influx of both um, scientific texts, from Greek a little over into Latin, yes, and uh, also commentaries. And those prove vital for the institutions <laughs> of learning, for example. <coughs> Step three is the transmission from Arabic to Latin, uh, which of course is for medicine a vital um, stage because this is where the texts that will function in the West in Latin were in partly also crafted. So what the Arabs did was use Greek knowledge and craft their own works, as was very common in the Middle Ages. You are not, uh, will not be accused of being uh, uh, of, of plagiarism if you just take a number of words or, or the text, a large chunk of somebody's text literally, and add a few things, and it's still your work. So it's a very different attitude nowadays, and students should not pay attention to this, of course, because it's very different now. <laughs> but the result is that the Arabs took certain uh, knowledge and information, a body of knowledge from Greek culture, and added their own um, analysis, synthesis to it, and that, will, that was what entered into the West. So it's this last, sta last stage is uh, important for um, medical texts and medical culture in the West. An important location for this stage, so from Arabic into Latin, is uh, Spain. 
And here is the mosque at uh, Cordoba. But another interesting uh, place is Toledo. We'll get to talk about that in a second. But Cordoba, just to give you a hint of the vibrant intellectual culture that was present, uh, Cordoba had um, a, a 70 libraries, and the largest we know contained 600,000 books. And compare that to the West, where the largest library at the time was in Paris, the, the growing university, and it had 400 books. <laughs> and it's not that Paris said, oh gosh, I wish we had more books. They were very proud of the number of books that they had. So that was the body of knowledge available in the West versus the texts and commentaries available in the East. It's a very different balance, very different uh, um, sort of uh, yeah, intellectual culture, much richer. And that's, of course, what um, was uh, entering the West in, in Latin. I must say that by the 14th century, the University of Paris, they would like me to say this, um, had grown to 2,000 volumes. We, know the, we have lots of books there too, they would say that. But still, it's not, it's not 600,000. Um, what happened in Spain, and this is also important for our understanding of medicine, and we'll, we'll get there very soon, um, is that translation schools start to appear. So it's not just individuals in their own uh, back rooms uh, translating these works. No, it's groups of individuals working together um, turning out sort of systematically almost a number of texts. And the reason behind this is that it was often organized by the church. Oddly enough, in Spain, there was a very different attitude, as we already saw, uh, seen uh, towards the East from people of the Western clergy. But um, we can also imagine that this happened, this group work, as it were, coordinated, because it was very difficult to do by yourself. The body of, uh, of knowledge is just too vast and also the language is too complicated. And this is something that people are looking at, uh, at uh, right now. Are we really to assume, I'm just raising the question, I'm not gonna talk about it because it leads me away from this track. Um, are we to assume that these people came to Spain from sp cities like Paris or even Scotland, we have an example of that, um, and acquired that language, Arabic, to the extent that they could translate these very complex works? The answer was always yes, but now recently, um, but also some voices are actually from the 1930s. People are saying, well, there must be an in-between stage somewhere. For, for example, Spanish vernacular or uh, Jews in Spain who uh, knew both Arabic and Latin and, and also Spanish. Um, so Mose Arabs, um, Christians who were, um, who were also available, uh, able to, to use both languages and sort of receive one and give it on to people in the other. So when I say translation schools, we should actually not think of uh, not just one person translating, or not even a group of people, but talking about an institution where um, Western clergymen are translating with the help of all sorts of other individuals that walk around. And we have lots of references to this because, for example, when um, a translator becomes very famous, like Michael Scott in the 13th century, people start to say, well, he didn't translate all these things himself. He had help. For example, Andreas, a Jew, helped him, or th this and that person helped him. So we have voices from the 13th century reflecting on these schools as being an institution where you know lots of things are happening. It's not just one individual or a group. It's actually the school itself, the institution that produces all these works. Um, in Spain, of course, uh, King Alfonso VI is, is important to sort of create the environment for doing this for the first time in the late 11th century, but also Alfonso X um, in the mid um, the 13th century, the same individual who creates the uh, University of Seville um, is also um, encouraging this. Mm. That's where he is. Um, this slide is actually showing you the most important city for our story, because here we see in Toledo a lot of bishops and clergymen from the West encouraging uh, the translation of these works from Arabic into Latin. Um, it happens, uh, surprisingly enough, I find, considering that first slide I showed you with uh, the battle between East and West, it happens in the uh, cathedral. So in the cathedral, there is a room and there is these translators. The school is gathering, <laughs> systematically producing at a high rate uh, these translations. Scientific, but also um, uh, theological, mystical texts, even from Hebrew. Um, important for this environment is uh, the Archbishop, Raymond, who dies in 1151. So he's, he's great. He's a patron of this uh, school, and it's important to have an, a, such an influential people person uh, sort of protecting you. Um, and we see, for example, translators such as 
uh, Adelaar of Bath, John of Spain, um, who, tr who translates the uh, philosopher uh, Avicenna, uh, logic then, so he translates logic from Arabic into Latin, and Jared of Cremona, and he's uh, vital for this. Uh, he dies in 1187, so he's working around the middle of the 12th century, and he uh, translates over th uh, 70 works of science, including a great deal of medical tracts, including uh, Avicenna's Canon of Medicine, and that will be a, uh, a very important text at the institutions of uh, medicine throughout the ages, all the way up to the 17th century. Uh, he also translates Asterio, uh, Aristotle, um, various texts, and this is where it happens. And he translates the uh, Almagest, the, the great work which travels from, and this is a very good uh, um, uh, text to show you how it works then, because it captures the things that I've talked about so far. It travels from Greek into Arabic into Latin. And you can see by the manuscripts uh, that the Latin tradition is, it's prettier as books, but it's not what you want, because it's not so utilitarian, it doesn't have so many schemes, it doesn't have uh, so much detail often, uh, uh, like tables, etc., as you have in other places. It's a great topic for another paper, but I should not talk about it um, today. Okay, so that's sort of the background. Starting in the late 11th century, the West encountered this wealth of information um, of Greek texts, went through Arabic into Latin, or original Arabic texts that were translated into Latin in places such as Spain, but also Italy, Sicily, uh, and as we will see in a moment, in um, uh, Monte Cassino, uh, very close to Rome. Now, what's so special about this knowledge, apart from the fact that it was new? There's a number of things why this knowledge stands out when you uh, look at sort of the making of so the sciences in the West. And there's two things that are very important. Uh, one is that the Arabs were very advanced in these fields. And just to give you an example uh, from ge uh, geometry, sorry, geometry and astronomy, um, they had a great deal of new texts, uh, new, is what the people in the, in the Latin West would say, that of information that they did not have at all before. I mean, uh, the University Library of Paris had few books. That's because th there was not more available. You know, had that been more, then this library would have been bigger. So um, astronomy is one of those fields where the Arabs are very sort of advanced. And you can see it. Oh, see the uh, astrolabe there in that uh, manuscript image and we have the actual astrolabes as well from the 11th to 12th centuries. This is just one uh, sort of uh, example, it's to measure the, uh, the constellations and that's something that the West was given, so a practical thing that now people could experience and do and practice um, themselves. Another thing, an example of something that uh, arrived and that actually was much earlier but uh, this is from around the year 1000, uh, Pope Sylvester II. Um, he was uh, already looking at the East for getting specific scientific information, so well before our period, but he was sort of pushed down. He was not allowed to do it anymore. He was called at the time, uh, you know, he's, he has a pact with the devil because he gets all this weird information from, from, from Arabs. Um, and one of the things that he, for example, already came with was the zero, the void, literally. Um, translated, um, but that's something that will actually be uh, introduced much later um, as part of a larger package of mathematics, and this is not e late 11th century even or 12th century, it, we have to wait till the early uh, 13th century to have this in the mathematical textbooks, so it takes a while before the zero catches on, but uh, Pope Sylvester was already very early um, with it. Uh, this is uh, Fibonacci, and he's the one that starts to uh, implement this, and then we're in the middle of the 13th century. And he starts to train individuals and provide school b books that help you do this, um, how to calculate with Arabic numbers. And this, of course, was a revelation because it's, tr you know, try to add up Roman numerals, make a complex uh, uh, um, uh, calculation with it. It's impossible. But with uh, Arabic numerals, it's very easy. I know this because we all do it every day. And the zero, of course, came in very handy and was also uh, very quickly started to be used for other things. And here's another very handy application in our own field, and we're nearing towards books. Um, that is as page numbers, in this case, a folium number. 
exfoliated on one side of the page. Um, so this is uh, 240. Um, if you want to do this in Arabic numerals, you need a great deal of, uh, sorry, in uh, Roman numerals, you need a great deal of the upper margin to do the same thing. So this is, a, you know, it's, it's a great thing to do if you can read it. Otherwise, of course, it's a pain to have uh, Arabic numerals in your, in your book that you, for example, acquire secondhand. Well, you know, can you imagine the surprise if somebody buys this book, two years of saving, opens it up, and there's things in there that you can't read. <laughs> but it's a handy thing also efficiently. Uh, it's uh, efficient-wise. It's, it's something that helps you um, find your text, but it actually takes a very little bit of space on the page. This is the scenery in which we have to place medicine, the coming of medicine. The broader scenery of scientific knowledge, of little bits of pieces of information that were not so scientific as such, the zero, but still, I don't know what it is, it's almost philosophical to have nothing meaning something. But that was set and introduced in uh, the West, and medicine was part of this larger scene. Um, this is one of the things that, um, so, so medicine is very broad, of course, but this is one of the things that was new that entered the West very early on in the late 12th century, which is uh, hu human uh, anatomy. And I like to think that you know, the images are more or less the same, but you can see there's much more text on the page in the Latin version. So it's much more explaining is done, and um, it's, it's also more simplistic. So this is, you know, it's more realistic. Uh, not that I know how these things look, but I can imagine that that's more like what it looks like than this. So this is almost like schematic. This is the idea behind it, still a little bit theor theoretical, whereas that one is more practical. A person has actually been sliced open, and let's see what the color and the shape is of all these intestines that we have in there. That's, that's not done for this, of course, because it's just being uh, copied from the Eastern tradition, but also it shows you not always with the full knowledge of what's actually going on. So in part, it's also just copying a body of knowledge, and then you have to find out actually what it means. The other thing that's very important early on is the manner of uh, transmission, that's to say in a setting of education. And that's also was not done in the West until this particular period. And we have to wait until the late 12th century or the middle of the 12th century for this to happen. But um, the, the classroom is an important uh, conduit for this knowledge because it gives you a setting where you can actually spar with individuals trying to find out what's really going on and also, of course, where a teacher tells you this is what's going on. So it's always a nice uh, mix of the two. Um, that's what we have on the left. So it's a tradition that comes from Arabic um, uh, culture. And we, we then, there's a very late image in Dutch. Uh, we have a similar setting at the end of the Middle Ages um, as a normal uh, means to provide people with scientific knowledge. OK, let's have a look at the early period uh, as far as medicine is concerned. So I'm, I'm not talking about the 13th century or the 14th century. I want to look at this dawn of the arrival of medicine in the West as part of this um, larger package of uh, the sciences. The value of medical knowledge to the West is twofold. Eastern medicine is trial and error based and based on physical evidence. It's what I said um, at the very start of my talk. That's one, so I don't have to say anything about it anymore. The other thing is this, um, this tradition that promotes knowledge <coughs> as a classroom um <coughs> subject. So something that you can uh, talk about in a setting of enriching yourself. So not so much as uh, improving yourself because you're a physician, but you're not a physician yet, but you're training to be one. And that's where you're being taught all these things. It's very normal for us because, of course, we don't have uh, students, first year students of medicine uh, actually operating on people and thank goodness we don't. But, but for the West that was new where you have a situation where you learn something in a, in, in a classroom setting like this and medicine was part of that larger picture. <coughs> um, just to give you one example and I'm moving um, inwards one more circle towards my actual nucleus that one manuscript. This is a, a very important, crucial text for the West. It's, it's a handbook that provides all the information that you need to be a physician. It presents it in two parts, the theoretical part and the practical part. So the theory uh, is uh, of the, the humors and uh, when you're too hot or you're too yellow, you sort of very medieval 
um, way of looking at um, conditions and of the functioning of human beings. But uh, the second part, the practical part, was very important, of course, because that provides practical information how to operate and how to uh, inquire if somebody's sick and what those sicknesses, illnesses might have been or might be. <coughs> this is um, the uh, text by Almaguzi. It's a 10th century text, and this is a copy from the very early 13th century. That is to say, the one on the right, the one on the left, it has a new title page that is much younger. So if you're an Arabist um, and you're about to protest and say, that's not 13th century, then I can say, yes, you're right. It's not 13th century. But the right-hand side is. So this particular work was translated into Latin, not in Spain, not in Sicily, but in Monte Cassino. And it was done by Constantine the African, who you see here teaching uh, medicine. And I just uh, tweeted uh, an image uh, announcing this paper on Twitter. And um, uh, I, I tweeted a similar image where people are actually holding these bottles. This is not a drink. This is urine that you look at because you need to see what the color is. And uh, th this is actually a very popular uh, picture in medical handbooks. In fact, the one I will show you, a very early one, uh, in a moment. So Constant the African is an interesting figure in this whole medical business uh, and also a vital one because what he does, he comes from um, Tunisia and he arrives uh, in the West, in Italy, um, in the 1060s or 1070s. And he uh, first goes to um, um, various uh, places. And he ends up, finally, in Monte Cassino. And Monte Cassino is one of the largest and oldest monasteries in the West. It's where uh, St. Benedict uh, taught and lived. And it's a, it's a the cultural, intellectual center of uh, Italy, but I would argue also of for the West in, in, in general. So this is where uh, Constantine arrives, and he has a number of things with him. He has books with him, uh, although there's a, a, a story that says that he capsized and a number of books were also lost. But we can imagine that he has a number of Arabic uh, texts with him. And he translates these there because he, of course, being from Tunisia, most likely a Christian, knows Arabic. And so he translates at least 24 a large medical text, including the text by al maguzi the handbook of the, for the physician that I just uh, showed you in Arabic. So he starts as the first person in the West, and he's doing it, this in the 1070s, 1080s. He dies before t before 1089 or 1080, sorry, before 1098 or 99. That's the official uh, complex um, expression of when he died, but that's what we know. We know that it's from a, a chronicle, and we know the year is 1098 or 1099, and he dies before that date. So he, he writes it still in the 11th century, and he makes um, available to the West these 24 very large medical works. <coughs> With this, he becomes instantly the most important medical translator. In, in fact, he becomes the first um, to translate text very literally from Arabic into um, into Latin. We have older individuals also in Italy, for example, Gario Pontus, who includes um, Arabic knowledge in Latin translated into his own works, but that's more spotted throughout. But what, what makes it so special, what um, Constant is doing, is that he takes full Arabic texts and translates it in Latin uh, at sort of a, in this one location, and then it starts to crawl through Europe, these texts. You can see it because um, I'm working with a group of medical. Um, historians, and we have uh, sort of acquired images of all surviving 400 or 500 um, books from this period, so from the, the 12th century Renaissance, the, the long 12th century, as, as it's sometimes called, so 1075, 1225. And um, when I date these works, and that's sort of my task in this group, I can see that the works sort of start to go slowly in the beginning and start to spread out, and then by the late 12th century, it goes really fast all over Europe. So this is actually um, one location that is a nucleus for the spread of the first spread, the first wave of these medical works. Okay, <coughs> next circle, jumping, all of us. Let's have a look how this medicine was introduced. So now you know how it was introduced, but I'm, of course, as a book historian, interested in how it was introduced physically on the page. So I'm now going to talk about uh, books and what they look like, and not so much about translations of or the cultural historical context, etc. We've done all this. All those circles are um, finished. I want to look at one particular manuscript. 
<coughs> it's this one, it's in The Hague, 73J6. And it contains then, constantly Africans, Pantechni, so the full art of uh, medicine. And it, uh, it contains the first part, the theoretical part, not the practical part. The date that you see there, 1075 to 1100, uh, that is my date, which is now being confirmed by other individuals. It was dated actually in very one very old catalog that was dated to the late 11th century. Most catalogs had it dated to the late 12th century. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this maze because it's important to know um, a little bit about it. But the first thing you need to know is that it is the oldest manuscript we have and the book I'm writing about it with uh, Francis Newton, who is a Monte Cassino expert, um, and much wiser than I am, and, and much older also. Um, <laughs> which of course, these two are linked, so I can, I can <laughs> say that. Um, we're, we're writing a book about this, and it's not just the oldest manuscript, but we are arguing that this book is actually made under supervision of uh, Constantine himself. So this was a book that he had on his desk, and I'll, I'll show you some things in a minute. But um, to, to get there, I need to explain mm, how we get there. That is, <coughs> I did a paper in The Hague in 2007, and um, I thought, isn't it nice if we all the delegates from the conference can look at some manuscript? And so I emailed the organizer and I said, gosh, do you want me to do perhaps a, a demonstration of manuscripts? And she said, oh, that's a nice idea. And so, okay, being in Canada still, I was in Victoria at the time, I uh, emailed the uh, librarian in The Hague and I said, can you get for me these manuscripts, and I'd never seen them, but I got them from a catalog. So I just asked him to put on a wagon um, everything that was translated from Arabic into Latin, because the uh, conference was about Aristotle and the transmission of knowledge, scientific knowledge from um, uh, Arabic culture into Latin culture. And so I arrived, I flew, the, flew there, did my thing with the conference, and then demonstration was there. And so a half hour before, I quickly went through all these books so I could more or less know what I was looking at with all these people. And that one book jumped from the table, almost literally. It was, it's a very odd book, as you can see, because it is very long and tall. And when you um, and have done the previous papers, uh, public lectures, you recognize this format, and I'll talk about it in a minute as well, so don't worry if you have no idea what I'm talking about. But it's unusual in, medi in the medieval period to have such a long and tall uh, manuscript. And so I was immediately drawn to this book, and I looked at it without having any knowledge of the, uh, the textual tradition of the Pantechni, and I dis deduced that this must have been late 11th century. So predating it with 100 years and making it sort of um, a, part, a product of the age of Constantine himself. I had no idea when I did this. Then I became acquainted later with uh, some medical historians and uh, I was invited to uh, participate um, to a, in a conference at Duke. I, this was when my wife was highly pregnant and uh, we had said that if my son was born, we knew it was a son, and there would be some weeks in between birth and the conference that I could go, and otherwise I would not go. And so I could see the time ticking away, and of course the conference is there, the sun is three weeks late. So I couldn't go, so I did it via Skype, and I just started to do my talk. And um, people were getting a little bit restless, because of course this was a very old manuscript, late 11th century, and the oldest one there, and um, as um, Francis Newton had seen, he was also there, by the images that I'd sent him a few weeks earlier. This was actually not just Italy, something that I also saw, but this was Monte Cassino. So we have a contemporary manuscript to Constant the African made on external evidence in Monte Cassino itself. And so this was quite uh, important and uh, it was a great debate that we had via Skype and all these individuals in the, in the real room. There's, there's a picture on the web, floating on the web, if you Google it, my name and uh, um, um, Monte Cassino or Pontecni, you'll, you'll find it where you see me sitting on the table on sort of a television screen, and all the other people discussing, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a TV screen. Conversation with people next to me. Not the strangest uh, encounter with uh, Skype, because I was at a conference where I was one of those people in the room, and uh, somebody else was there. This was when the volcano ashes uh, prevented flying in, in 2010, and the organizer of the conference could not fly to her own conference because she was on the other side of the cloud, but she was on a laptop and she went with us uh, when we had coffee and dinner. She was always, <laughs> she was always there, and, and she had her own dinner at her own table. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so it's an important manuscript, not just for its age and for the location, but also for something else. <coughs> it contains, and you can see it here, gaps in the text. And gaps in the text, uh, it's, a, it's a, what we call lacunae. 
is something that I had just happened to have studied the year before and that I just published about in a different scientific manuscript, uh, something that was translated by Michael Scott at the court of Frederick II in Sicily. Um, this is an Aristotle work. This is, when you look at these two boxes, the blue boxes, are X uh, gaps, so to speak. They have been filled in. So the idea of the gap is, I do not know what this means, this term in this case, because furcula is fork bone and apostema is, uh, is uh, pus. So, so the person does not know what this means. So that makes total sense because you have Arabic scientific terms that have no Latin equivalents. You need to sometimes figure out <coughs> what it means in Arabic, and then you need to figure out how you're gonna, gonna call this in Latin, it's very difficult. And so these terms were problems for translators, and this is one argument of three to say this particular manuscript, so it's not the one we're talking about, but the one from Michael Scott, was made in his vicinity. So when I saw this, I got very interested because I knew this, these are red flags. Somebody is not happy with the translation. Mm -hmm. And it's particularly important, of course, because the book is made in Monte Cassino during the age of Constant the African. And the idea is that I find it very unlikely that this translator will let somebody else finish his work th you know, while he's sitting there. So it's very likely, and that's the argument, it's, you know, it's, not a, it's, it's, it's a likely scenario that um, Constantine was busy still upgrading this particular translation, his, his largest uh, medical handbook. So this is also then a very good object for us to see how medical knowledge was dished up, dished up in, in the late 11th century when it was just starting to get available in the West. I mean, we're here at the heart of the institution that started to produce these medical works, and here we have the translator who is likely supervising the production of this particular book, we have an object here that tells us how people in the West thought that medical knowledge should be put on the page. It's a unique situation, so let's have a look at it. Um, the book is copied by two scribes. This is the most odd thing about the manuscript. Um, up to very end of the manuscript, five pages left to copy, the scribe stops. So you can, you know, in a sense you can say it's unfinished, or you can say this is also a gap in the text. It's, it's not finished in, uh, on the desk of the translator, and therefore the scribe could not continue anymore. It was still figuring out um, what happened there. Also interesting is this. This tells you something about, uh, we've also talked about this in some classes uh, the past week. This tells you something about the quality of the manuscript, namely the outside of the skin the rim that you would normally cut away because it's not suitable for making books. It's too slippery. Uh, it has holes, and you can see it here. The translator, uh, the, the sorry, the scribe. I don't think it's the translator, but it's the scribe and the translator standing behind him. Skip this because you can't write here. It's too thin and translucent. So this is um, for me as a book historian. It's nice because this is not a fancy copy. Not only can I see that because the script is not really very fancy. It's a little bit scruffy. But, but also you can see that the people itself in the time period didn't uh, find it necessary to copy this in a very beautiful way, as you sometimes see medicine copied later on in the Middle Ages. In other words, this was a book that was um, made for utilitarian use, not for looking at, but for actually using, using, so to speak, not just for reading. So that's what this particular um, image tells you. The other thing is, The other thing is that the script is very tiny. And just to give you an example, there are 62 lines to the page, and the text block, so not the page, but the text block, the area that's written, um, is 190 millimeters, which uh, adds up to three millimeters per line, which is very tiny. And it's precisely comparable to the Paris Bible, so the very tiny pocket Bible that uh, Dominican friars had with them when they went from uh, place to place to do their sermon business. <coughs> So, obviously, this scribe uh, tried to cram as much uh, text on the page as possible. So, um, uh, to save parchment, perhaps, low-cost book would be interesting, or for another reason that we'll talk about in a, in a minute. It's also a very thin book, it's only 88 folia, so it adds up to something like this. For a medieval manuscript, that's not very much. The most interesting thing, and also the most useful thing for us, if we're trying to deduce how this book was used, for what purpose it was made, <coughs> is that it was 
as I said, much narrower than the average medieval manuscript. So by this time, the average width is 0.7 of the height of the page. So the relative width is 0.7 compared to 1 being uh, the, uh, the height. And, and that's what you see on the left-hand side. Uh, here it is 0.57, and you can see how much difference that makes. It feels very different, right? It's a very whole, a high tall book, and we actually have evidence from the Middle Ages, uh, people looking at this kind of book saying, this is very tall, it's a very odd, oddly uh, made manuscript. So there's a reason why this was done, and um, some of you in the room have uh, a perfect good idea why this was done. It was done because you can hold it in your hand very easily. And this is a good parallel. Um, Cantatoria and Tropers, both used by soloists during the Mass, are all the copies from before 1200, dozens of them, are this narrow, are breaking with the rules of medieval book production in that they uh, present a text on a page that's too narrow. That's what you see also um, in the medical manuscript. And actually, there's a whole bunch of older uh, medical manuscripts that have a similar narrow page. Um, it, it's, it goes to, I don't want to do the whole paper again that I did last week, but uh, it suffices to say that this parallel of handheld is likely also what you should um, assume for these medical manuscripts. And the reason why this is handheld um, is twofold. Two, re two possible reasons, but I'm going to choose for one at the end. So this is um, what you can get from looking at images of medical manuscripts. Here you see uh, a person holding a book under his arm as he is teaching a student how to heal a, a patient. So he, he has panic on the Titanic, he says, ah, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> well, you just do this, right? He's not like, because uh, he knows it all by heart. So this is just a book that he has with him, so his knowledge, body of knowledge that will help when the patient starts to uh, explode, so to speak. <laughs> um, here's another one. Physicians at the patient's bedside. In both scenes, the, the, the narrow book will help because it helps you to hold it in your hand because what it does, a narrow book is, it uh, brings the pressure from the fingertips to the palm of the hand. And you, you can do this, try this at home. When you get home, you take the broadest book out of the cupboard that you have and you hold it like this. The middle will come up and the book will fly away. <laughs> right? If you have a, a narrow book, a diary or, so, or something, um, it will be in your hand very easily and you can hold it even when you maneuver through the room. And that's, of course, what you have here. The other scenario where books were handheld is education. Because in education also, teachers needed to walk around with something in their hand as they explained um, the text to their, to their pupils. And this is a very good example where we see Hugh of St. Victor uh, teaching to his students and he's holding, I would even argue, for a very um, narrow book in his hand. But that could just be the iconography of this particular image. And I've, I've been trained well and I'm, I'm not to assume that what I see really happened. But, but he's, he, does, he is holding something um, in his hand. So this is likely the scenario for use, not so much the patient's bedside, because the theory part of the pond technique will not heal anybody. It gives you a good solid background on how to understand medicine, but it will not stop any wounds or uh, make any pus uh, leave the body any quicker. So this is uh, likely used then for uh, holding up in one's hand in the classroom. And so this is a very good example of a book that uh, was likely used very early on in the classroom setting in Monte Cassino, perhaps. I'm starting to make that argument now because we've never dared to say that, that the, the heart of the dissemination of medical knowledge in the West, it's Monte Cassino, was also cont uh, having in its, uh, within its walls a school. With, there's no evidence for this. But there is actually, when you're a book historian and you look at different things, there is a very interesting piece of evidence <coughs> And that is this. This is known to be used by, Mont uh, by a teacher within Monte Cassino. It's a grammar book. And this has exactly the same width, 0.56. The other one was 0.57. So it is um, a nice parallel to the handbook, the medical handbook. Namely, when we know it's used by a teacher, it looks like this. Well, it's a rhetorical thing to say. And therefore, also, this medical book was used like that. But you know, it's, I'm tempted to say this. And there's a good, at least, indication that this is the case. This is sort of concludes phase one, not of the paper, don't worry, we're almost there, but um, phase one of the dissemination of these texts, the coming of these texts, and then the further transportation of these texts through Europe. I just wanted to briefly say something about that second <coughs> stage, namely the late 12th century to the 13th century, because 
It's necessary because what I've showed you now is actually an inkling of what happens later. Already it's being used in a classroom setting, Monte Cassino perhaps, or somewhere else. Maybe it was made for a teacher uh, in the outside world. <coughs> um, and so when you look at the Corpus Vetustius, which is the Aristotle book that I mentioned before, this is your typical scholastic 13th century handbook used by uh, students and teachers in the classroom. And it's very interesting to see that actually the things that you um, can define as typical for this kind of book, for example, paragraphs that explain um, this is what we read now from paragraph to paragraph. So read from, from red paragraph to blue paragraph. That's what I will start to explain to you. And when we're done discussing about it, the next stage, then we'll read from the blue one to the next red one. So that's how it works. Um, that's going to be the normal way of presenting Aristotle and other scientific knowledge in the West, as you see here, three examples of those books from all over Europe around contemporary. But that's also, um, oh darn, where's my image? Okay. Okay, I don't have a picture. Trust me that uh, medical books look exactly the same way. So they also have um, sort of a large margins with lots of paragraphs with lots of uh, room for glossing etc so the medical book will start to adopt this particular format uh, showing you that by this time it's sort of a fixture in the classroom it's just like aristotle medicine is also taught in this new manner of reading a little bit and discussing a little bit um, just to show you that sort of thinking about how you present the text on the page and that's just what we saw uh, well we didn't see it in the medical book because i don't have the image but uh, you saw it in Aristotle. That's something that's already starting much earlier in the late 11th century. Here we have um, uh, Gariopontus' prologue to his text, and he says, if anybody desires to know intently the content of this whole book, let him first per peruse quickly through these, um, quickly these preceding chapter headings, which he finds listed in brief citation at the head of this little book. Um, I owe this to um, Eliza Glaze, who uh, sent me this particular picture and also this uh, transcription because it's, it's, a, it's a very good example of how people early on also had an inkling of we need to present this knowledge in a way that's easy to consume, which is of course what you see at the climax of that movement is the scholastic manuscript that I just showed you. But in the, l in the late 11th century, people are already thinking about, okay, if we put a little list of chapters in front of the actual books, then we can very quickly go through these chapters so quick access to the text, rather than that we actually have to read everything and see if there's something in there that we need for, for example, healing somebody or for understanding uh, medicine as a, as a field. The last thing I want to say is, uh, I'm returning to this book in The Hague, the book that came from the desk of, <coughs> very likely, Constantin himself. <coughs> in the late 12th century, when it starts to be a very common book used in education, we see that the focus of the book changes. So these are the, large, the last pages of the book, and you can see that there's all sorts of things scribbled, um, added to it by one individual. This is likely a physician who adds text that he finds interesting from other books, so uh, excerpts, including, there is your uh, urine bottle again, so to, to show you how you hold a urine bottle so you can actually see what the color is, and then you can deduce things from it as you can read it in text. So this is where the theory, the theoretical book that this is, this is only the first part as I explained, the theory part, becomes more practical. People start to add things of their own. So it's a sort, of, sort of a second life that's given to this book and a more practical one and reflective of the late 12th century when medicine becomes a more practical business. Same thing happens, happens in the front, a different hand, adds all sorts of texts um, explaining uh, the very practical uh, dimension of medicine. So the conclusion is that medicine evolves from theory to practice, that books follow this theory to practice movement, um, and also that individuals then start to use, handle these books in a different way than they um, did, say, a century or two centuries before. So the, the, the medical books would first be perused in monasteries and in private settings, perhaps, but ultimately they would become um, part of the curriculum at universities and other schools of education. So what we actually see in this movement, in the world of the medical book, and I've shown you only one manuscript, but this is a much broader movement, is how the West truly catches up 
with the East, not just contents-wise, not just intellectually speaking, but also the books themselves become more practical um, uh, devices, more practical passer honors of uh, information that is uh, newly available in the Latin West. Thank you very much. <laughs>
what evidence yeah. is there that that is an actual figure? Yeah, I think what might have happened there is um, that uh, they may have counted the individual books. Um, I'm not sure if the Arabs were big on scrolls. Um, I don't think at this period, but that's another possibility when you have a, like a uh, like a inflated number. Then it might be that that each scroll has an individual book in. But in this case, they might have counted individual uh, books within a larger text. Okay. The yeah. other quick question is if you could speak a little bit about um, these questions of authorship, where uh, translate translators usually acknowledged in these texts, or do mm -hmm. we know for sure who translated, who was the author of the text, or yeah. not? Yeah. So I'm just I'm just curious about yeah. that. There's there's colophons where uh, names are mentioned. Um, if you take the text that we that we looked at in the Hague, the book. It says in the beginning that this was made for uh, the abbot of uh, Monte Cassino uh, by a consort in the African. So often the translators name themselves. It's also that they named others. So they may say this person translated this and this and this and this. Uh, we also have um, uh, lists in which, for example, a translator says, I moved away from uh, Toledo, but I left behind my translations of this and this and this and this and this text. We have that, for example, from one translator. And so you can theoretically, uh, for example, Gerard of Cremona left for Italy, but he, he left his, his uh, translations behind, some of them, and he mentions that. But generally, yeah, you have to dig and, and also compare. <coughs> well, one of let me just uh, show you one uh, image from the very beginning, which I skipped. Yeah, this one. This is typical for Gerard of Cremona, Cof Esquia, and the cause is, he uses this every five lines, six lines, and so you recognize it as being from him, and so when you, when you have a translation and you see this all the time, then you may well assume that it is his, because it's sort of a, you know, a, a staple of, of his uh, manner of translating the text. There's a question at the back. <laughs> well, before he entered the monastery of Monte Cassino, he was not uh, a monk. So he was a Christian, uh, Arabic Christian from Tunisia, and could go wherever he wanted. So he just became a monk? He became a monk, and then he was more uh, sort of required to stay in one location, had to ask permission, <laughs> just like everybody else. Yeah. But before he entered uh, the monastery, he went to, for example, to Salerno to teach, which is interesting. So apparently he knew Latin as well. And so I've been doing some digging into the Latin use in Africa, which was very rusty. And uh, one of the things that we, uh, you know, I'm just throwing some more information out there at you, but um, one of the things that we know about uh, Constantine is that he had helpers who helped him put his Arabic translation, so his Latin that he already knew, into better Latin, more classical Latin, it says. So we, we can s assume that this is the rusty sort of uh, African Latin that was more polished up to match the Latin of Italy. No, we know very little. We think he's from Tunisia, but we don't know for sure. Um, and there's very little known about him. Yeah. There's some myths, but yeah, those are myths. But facts are, there's uh, s s sparing, s sparingly information. Yeah. Before we go on with more questions, let me just interpose uh, a small announcement for your final talk tomorrow yeah. at the Royal Alberta Museum at 7. We're in it for the money, the birth of commercial book production which is free and open to all. So we hope to see some of you there. But please, I just wanted to, uh, to interpose that before everyone else left. I'm uh, still writing it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just, Are there more just questions? writing. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a very good point. No, um, this is a textbook that you make for a student, so that's all gearing up a text for a classroom situation where speed is of an essence and understanding of the text. But physicians made very different notations in the books. Uh, it will have been uh, practical things, you know, I tried this, well, I'm not going to do that again, right? <laughs> so, so you have lots of uh, margi marginal notes. But they're much more scruffy, less coordinated, and more um, experiential, uh, you know, practice-based. Yes. Uh, these books must have been very expensive, and, uh, and keeping uh, the, the, the scribes, etc., must have been involved a lot of financial resources. What happened in the 12th century that, or what financial, economically, financially? Mm -hmm. I, 
I'm not sure. It's, uh, it seems that there was no problems uh, um, acquiring books and making them, um, even though it was expensive. Did the climate change, or was there no, you know, a long period of peace? Or yeah, the, well, no, I think uh, all I can think of is that text became so important that they may have made the means available to disseminate them. Um, but the big explosion comes in the 13th century. Mm. And the books there are much better on much better parchment and professionally made, as we'll talk about tomorrow. I think, I think if anything, it's, uh, if I may, yes, uh, it, it has a lot to do with the growth of towns and the rapid differentiation of standards of living, <coughs> of resources available uh, to um, to town to city dwellers in particular. So if we think of the Middle Ages as one state of one condition of life, the way we have in Canada today, we fail to understand the vast differences that they lived uh, with no books whatsoever anywhere in the countryside except monasteries mm -hmm. and maybe cities vastly wealthy compared to the countryside with as many books as you want. Uh, Spain is a good example of that yes. for the simple reason that it, it, all of it is vastly more wealthy than the rest of Europe in the 12th century. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I hope to see you tomorrow in the RAM. At, uh, it's proving to be an interesting paper, as far as I can tell, because I'm sort of halfway. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how it turns out tomorrow. Then. <laughs>